All right. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our discussion on designing and implementing automation and conversational AI. Um, I'm joined by a large team that I'll introduce very quickly um, in a couple of minutes, but also welcome online as well. I think we've got a couple of hundred people that are going to be as asking questions, and I'll repeat uh, as we go through the discussion. Um, so just a few uh, things I want to call out. First of all, this is a hybrid session, so I will be mixing in between in person and taking messages on, on the Teams call as well. Um, if you're not comfortable with being on recording, feel free to, to leave if you don't want to be you know, visible, visible or heard, um, and you can join and watch the recording later on as well. Um, we'll quickly jump onto the Teams, and then we will go straight into topics and questions, and, and we want this to be free-flowing. We don't want it to feel too rigid. Um, so, you know, ask questions as you please about roadmap, features, what you're excited for, and yeah, we can uh, have a good discussion for the next 45 minutes. Um, so, quick one. So, I'm Jack Robotham. I'm one of the Power Platform Marketing Managers at Microsoft. So, I'm, I have the pleasure of working on Power Virtual Agents and helping with Power Automate at times as well. Um, so, super excited to have you all here. Uh, we'll start with Gary as well, if you want to start from the Power, Power Virtual Agent side. Yeah, hi. My name is Gary Pretty. I'm a uh, Principal PM on the Power Virtual Agents team. Hi, all. I'm Kendra Springer. I'm the Principal Design Lead for the Power Virtual Agents team. And I am Dwayne Robinson, and I am a principal program manager with Power Virtual Agents, and I work with like field and customers uh, and such. So many of you come talk to me afterwards. And I'm Ashwini. I'm a product manager on the Power Automate team. Amazing. Thank you. And I believe we've got Ashwin and Wasim, if you want to come off mute and have a quick introduction. Sure thing. I'm Ashwin. I'm part of the Power Customer. First, Ashwin, if you can hear us. <laughs> can you hear me? Can you folks hear me? Hello. Can it come through? Uh, we can, can hear, hear you on the call. Do you want to do a quick introduction? Sure. Yeah. I'm yeah, Ashwin. Yeah. I'm uh, from the Power Customer Advisory Team. So I work with some of our marquee customers in helping them with their automation journey. Brilliant. Thanks, Ashwin. Uh, and I'm uh, Wasim. Uh, I'm a group uh, engineering manager in the uh, Power Automate Team. Amazing. Thank you. So we've got a wide set of people with lots of knowledge across automation and Power Virtual Agents building chatbots as well. So happy to start with any popular topics that are top of mind for you, or we can start with some um, popular ones that we're already hearing from the from Microsoft build already. Any questions? No? If, if not, we can start with the most popular topic, AI. <laughs> so AI has been an awfully uh, popular topic across automation, building automations and chatbots and flows and all those sort of things. So I'm going to start with Ashvini. If you want to give us a bit of an update on what do, what is what is well not what does AI mean for Power Automate? How is it helping makers you know build more intelligent workflows? Yeah, sure. So AI really it's at all levels of our experiences. First of all, it starts from making it easier for people to build automations because usually we have intent in our mind. It's sometimes translating that intent into actual automation just takes a lot of skill and a lot of time and a lot of trial and action uh, trial and error to make that happen. So since last uh, October, actually, we've released something called Describe It to Design It, where you can describe your intention in natural language and we'll give you a starting point for an automation. And uh, as of last night, we've now brought it uh, even, even further with a new design time experience and a co-pilot as well. So just continuing to make it easier for people to build automation. The second one is how do, so we have over a thousand connectors in the ecosystem today. And uh, which is, is awesome. Yeah, come on. Great, great <laughs> momentum. Uh, not counting the custom connectors. So now, how does AI reason over those thousand and those custom connectors is the next wave of what we're looking at is to be able to understand if you've got third party systems, if you've got your own custom systems that you want to go automate, how does Copilot understand what can your systems do and how do you put them in, into the automation as well? So that's, uh, there's a long road ahead of us on the AI front. Uh, intelligent document processing, right? What does that mean in the in the world of uh, LLMs, where we're used to having very specific models for very specific things, but now with many general purpose models available, and how do we go tap into that to make it easier for people to deal with more unstructured and nuanced uh, documents as well? So a lot of a uh, lot of excitement. Amazing. Thanks so much, Ashvini. Uh, we'll come to Gary. Gary, give us a bit of an update on AI and Power Virtual Agents as well. 
Yeah, sure. So I, I guess a lot of uh, similar themes uh, when it comes to Power Virtual Agents. Um, we also have a co-pilot available within PVA that allows you to accelerate your bot development. And that's really sort of changing the game for uh, bot builders in terms of you being able to simply describe the topics that you want to build and getting a great head start. And we also have the ability to iterate, continually iterate on your topics using Copilot as well. But I think where we're seeing the most impact today is really the impact for the uh, what we call the C2, the end users, um, with a feature that we've called um, generative uh, answers. And this is the ability for you to actually make your bot incredibly useful right out of the box without having to do any authoring at all. You simply point your bot at a website or more than one website now as a build. Um, and it can instantly answer questions based on the content of that website. We'll search across it and then we'll summarize the, uh, the answer using GPT. Um, and this has really changed the game actually for both the developers and the end users. For the developer, it means that what was previously a you know, potentially months long uh, journey where you were having to curate knowledge bases, it's certainly a popular thing that we've seen with bots over the years is to develop a sort of Q&A knowledge base. That is now done in seconds. Um, but also the fact that from a C2 perspective or an end user perspective, um, you're able to get um, sort of answers on a much broader scope than you were previously. And so these things are just becoming more and more useful over time. Um, we've just expanded that as well to work with internal knowledge base for uh, when you're actually authenticated with a bot. So you can now, um, we can now answer questions from SharePoint, from OneDrive, et cetera. And so it's, um, it's been an incredible step forward in a very short amount of time. Um, and if you uh, come to the keynote later on today, you'll also see the next step in what we are, um, we'll be sort of showing off a, a feature called a generative actions, where we'll use GPT along the sort of similar lines that we were talking about in terms of um, uh, reasoning over those sort of plugins. So definitely check that out. Thank you very much. Um, okay. And so, yeah, go on, Kendra, okay. absolutely. The other thing that I would add to with how we're leveraging, you know, Power Virtual Agents has always had AI interwoven in our product since its inception, right? But how we're really leveraging generative AI is in a couple of ways. And it's really based in improving experiences for both our C1, our makers, our authors, as well as our C2, you know, the end users of the bots that are being created. And what I mean here is Gary touched on it a little bit. With generative answers, you're able to really improve the scale at which your bot can answer unexpected questions that you didn't manually author, right? And no longer does the C1 have to, or the maker have to keep up multiple sources of knowledge, right? Now, as long as your main, you know, sources of knowledge, whether they're internal or your external website is up to date, the information that your bot is returning is also up to date. So that is a much better authoring experience, right? And it really helps drive efficiency and a much better, you know, end user experience because instead of getting escalations where maybe, you know, these bot makers weren't expecting to author these topics to cover them, GPT generative answers is able to actually gather information and provide accurate responses. And it's the same thing within the authoring canvas, right? So if you think about how Copilot is helping our users get started, one thing I always notice when I'm observing users in like uh, PDA in a day or, you know, just talking to customers to see how they get started building their bots, it's really that cold start that is a very big blocker of like, what do I need to build? What topics do I need to build? Like, uh, should I draw this out? Should I diagram it on a on a on a piece of paper? And and research shows that you know the problems that a bot can really help your organization with, right? But how to get started and how to get over that initial hump is really challenging. And so even just having Copilot generate starter content for you, even if you have to go back and review, right? That is such a much better experience and really helps to drive efficiency, guide you as a bot maker, and help point you in the right direction of how to create these really engaging and dynamic topics. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Do any of you good? Do you want to add anything else? Or? Amazing. 
All right, so one of the questions that we're getting from the chat is availability. You just said all these awesome features for co-pilots in Power Automate and Power Virtual Agents. What, what does that mean? Like, can I use it across any region? Um, what is the availability status? So we'll start with Ashwini. Uh, yeah, so for Power Automate, there are a few capabilities that are already available today. These are being able to call an Azure OpenAI from either your desktop automation or the cloud. That's been available for a, for a few months now. Uh, last night, what we released in the preview region was the co-pilot experience in Power Automate. So this is a new designer for Power Automate and uh, a new co-pilot experience as well. And we'll be showing that off at 4 o'clock today. So please, uh, please check us out at 4 o'clock uh, later today. Uh, so that is available in preview regions. We're rooting it out across the US uh, as we speak, as we get feedback on that. Amazing. Thank you. Power Virtual Agents team. Oh, yeah, don't you take it? Okay. Oh, you take it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I got voted onto the island. That's that's always fun. Um, so, uh, so as far as in the power virtual agent space, uh, we actually GA'd. Um, if you've not heard us talk about power virtual agents, or PVA two is an internal code name that we were using. It was really the unified authoring canvas. This unified authoring canvas is the Think of it as the moment where we move to a single bot authoring studio inside of Microsoft. So if you are a bot framework customer, you're familiar with it, this is the unification moment. This is the moment where our SaaS platform is capable of doing what you could do with bot framework, but being able to do it where you don't have to figure out what state store you need and all those type of things. And that's an actual major moment for us. We've been working on this for two years, right? And so that is a really massive moment for us. And it actually leapfrogs us well over competition when you look at the way that it builds and the way that it works. And so it has a little bit different component model if you're a bot framework customer, so definitely take a look at this. Uh, if you want, we also have, uh, we're kind of over in the low code section. If you want to come talk to us, you want to see some of the stuff. Um, if you're doing something really complex, we can show you how to, how to achieve those things. So that was one of our major moment, moments in that GA at, I think, about 8 a.m. yesterday morning. We're all just uh, in an Uber <laughs> going, high five. <laughs> you know, so, so we're really excited about that. And then um, as we, one of the things that we decided to do as well is the PVA Copilot, which is, um, you'll hear us say C1 and C2, just really quick. A C1 is someone who is basically, think of it as a bot author and a C2 is a bot user in our world. So we have two users. And so the authoring experience, when we went into generative AI, we said, how can we affect both of our users? And the co-pilot for Power Virtual Agents is the natural language way to be able to build and also iterate upon building a conversational agent. And so that actually also GA'd. Uh, yesterday. Unexpectedly, we, we decided to pull that in. We felt like it was good enough that we would go ahead and ship that into GA. And then you saw a public preview refresh that happened for generative answers. So now generative answers can now do multiple knowledge sources. Um, and it can also do knowledge sources such as SharePoint and also OneDrive. And you also will see that we have changed it to also be available as a node within the conversation. And so this is a major refresh that's happening inside of the public preview. And that we will continue to work throughout the year. Uh, our goal is to quickly try to get these things into a GA release uh, that you guys can get to. So that's kind of what we have going on uh, on our side. And then there is a, a private, very limited edition private preview that will be announced today um, on stage where we're talking about the generative actions component which is kind of like a sort of a lane chain type of concept if, if you really must, right? And I, um, I do think it's worth calling out. So when we talk about general availability, for the new Canvas, that's generally available worldwide. Um, for Copilot, that's still generally available only in the US and only for English. And so I think it's worth you know, just calling out the fact that our GPT features, I think it's very, very similar, a similar picture right now across, across Microsoft. Um, we do hear the feedback that people would like to get access to these features um, in other regions. 
it's something that's absolutely on our roadmap and it's something that we're working towards as fast as we possibly can. Um, as you can probably tell, a lot of these things, are, you know, it's the, the world is changing pretty quickly. Um, and so, you know, we, we are working to move faster. Um, and as soon as we can get these features available in other regions and into customers' hands, we absolutely will do. I know Dwayne hears that every day. I had one more thing about the. <laughs> We're very excited about GAing our our unified canvas. One point I really wanted to emphasize because I think it's so pertinent to this audience is, you know, within the Power Platform for for a long time we've been focused on that low code, you know, ability to enable subject matter experts to really build great things while the developer, you know, personas are still working in different tools, right, and needing to kind of merge these applications and, and figure out the best way to collaborate. This unified canvas really does exemplify fusion team capabilities, both from like collabor collaboration tools like commenting, but also the ability to go fully into a pro code first experience if you want to use the code behind editor, and a lot of other great features. So I did just want to emphasize that it, it really does support that Fusion team and that ability to work together as a developer with your subject matter experts. One last thing about regionality and availability, um, because one of the things that you should be aware of is that we do actually have the opportunity to take some limited customers to uh, to production ahead of GA availability. So if there is a situation where you look at it and you go, this is really good and I would like to approach us, know that you can reach out to your local account team and they can work with us and we can work on an early access type of production thing that we're working on. We know a lot of customers are saying this is really good. And when it comes to regionality, language is big, a bigger problem for us because we have to rely on the back end GPT models and things to be able to support that. Uh, also making sure that those things are safe for those different languages and things of this nature. But other regions for English um, are also something that we're evaluating. But we, we're going to have to do it off of market demand just because of the different compute constraints that we have to work within right now. Um, so I just want to make sure that, that you guys were aware of that. Yeah, so I think what Gary mentioned, we, we are all running yeah. quite quite fast uh, across the teams to to deliver this as quickly as possible. And some of the models, like uh, 3, 3.5, may be available in, in the in EU. So there'll be some functionality that shows up in Europe. There's some other copilot depends on GPT-4, and that's only available. The, the, the GPUs uh, of them may be constrained and only available in the US. So our intention is to make it available as broadly as possible, as quickly as possible. But there's these, and you'll see some some parts of the product being available in the US uh, and the EU, some parts of them only in the US right now, some in, only in the preview region. So there's a little bit of messiness uh, and uh, until we get to a stable new baseline across everyone. Amazing. So lots of good stuff happening. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I'd love to open it to the room. I know we've taken some questions within the chat, but yeah, feel free to put your hands There's up. One right here, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a question in this case because we are always dealing with the limit limit of the token input that I need to have using the of GPT four. Obviously, GPT four comes with a very high like limitation, or maximum limitation, limitation, but actually it comes with also price tag, right? Mm -hmm. So like if, in a power power virtual agent, is there any kind of technique to help us to actually fine tune the, this type of process to keep up with the context, mm -hmm. as long as like also putting the right amount of the knowledge information to the model so that I can generate the response. Like, oh, okay. Okay. Great, great question. So I'm just going to quickly repeat that for yeah. everyone remote. Uh, I'll try to summarize it. It's a little bit long. But thank you very much for the question. So uh, you're currently building a, a chatbot with the OpenAI service direct, the Azure OpenAI service. You're having some challenges with the complexity of kind of the prompts, and you're reaching a token limit, and you're wondering whether Power Virtual Agents can help you kind of help manage that, that complexity, right? Hopefully that summarized it to a degree. Anyone? Yeah. Take that? So, so there's a couple of things. Um, number one is we should, we should definitely take a look at, and I would tell you guys, there's a lot of people who are trying to jump ahead. And the answer, like, in other words, I'm going to go buy the bricks from Azure that we're building PVA on top of. And that can cause some challenges when you get there. Like, a, a great example, 
is if you're looking at is it is it viable from a financial standpoint for you to build on top of GPT-4 for you to do excessive turns, right, and things of that nature. So part of what we do inside of PVA and part of what we're doing in the generative answers piece specifically is turning that into a SaaS thing. So you just supply the knowledge and then we generate the response off of that. That includes many things. One is not just a model and generation of a model and managing prompts, but we actually shipped in the public preview as well, context. So if you do this in a generative answers uh, capacity, more than likely you don't have to manage this problem, right? Because that problem is fairly complex. You're gonna need to have people who understand that, not to mention if you go and roll out a GPT 3.5, and then you have to figure out when does it financially make sense for you to go from 3.5 turbo to 4.0, all of this is stuff that we're doing, and the reasons why you'll see us adopt them behind the technology curve of the Azure components when they become available is we actually have an entire team working to see, is it viable from a financial standpoint to build an application like this? Because it's really great that you guys can go build a really cool demo, but if you can't financially afford to roll it out to your world, then you've just made a really cool demo. Right, so part of what we're doing is making sure that one, it's financially viable, two, it's scalable, and then we're also making sure that we're making sure it's safe and that you have the knobs and the dials that you need to tune to be able to do that. But when you get into, I wanna have a custom model and I wanna continue to have that conversation, we've actually got some strategies. I, I don't wanna get into the specifics of those here because I feel like it's probably a little much, um, but if you'll drop by the, the low code booth up upstairs for us, what we can do is we can give you kind of the current strategies that we have if you're going to hand it down to Power Automate, but you are going to have the challenge that it's going to continue to increase your token set over time if you aren't managing it in a certain way. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to make it where you don't have to do this as we go forward. And then as we start looking at being able to plug a, a custom model directly into the conversational stack, it will make that easier for you. Uh, versus having to do it, uh, keep in mind that one of the things that we currently, uh, like we did a we did a preview release of CLU. And are you guys people familiar with CLU? It's our, uh, basically our, our custom language models. A lot of people who are bot framework people have been using Lewis, the upgrade for Lewis is CLU. And the way that we actually integrated it is we took the connector library that the Power Automate team has done an amazing job at growing, right? We talked about how many connectors. And we actually took the CLU connector and made it where we could call it directly from the runtime. So we've laid the foundation of being able to call a connector directly from PVA. And when we do that, it's going to change the challenges that you're running into in prop management. So I think this is going to help you because then the conversational stack isn't API call with no context to it. It'll give us the ability that the runtime itself can understand that you actually were talking to something, not just Power Automate. So that's where it's going to go to be able to make that happen for you. Um, but there are some strategies through Power Automate that we've come up with that can help you with multi-turn conversation. Um, so drop by and we can talk about it. Matter of fact, uh, I think we've even got some of our PowerCat team here who's in the audience um, that work on this exact scenario. And we've got a couple of different ideas of how to make that manageable for you. So we'd love to get feedback on if those are good strategies for you. Excellent, cool. good question. Yeah, we've got a question on the right. I'm curious, what's, um, how is the governance story evolving with all of these new features? One of the things I run into a lot is implementation of the governance and security and all of that. And then you have the but there's no granular, granular governance controls, and so the organization won't let me have it at all. I just don't get a license, I can't do it. On, on, on PowerVersal agents, or okay. in general question. But like when we think about conversation boosters, or I think you're calling them generative answers now, mm -hmm. yes. you know, going to internal documents, like how do we make sure that it doesn't hit, you know, some kind of restricted area that I'm not supposed to have, you know, make sure that it, you know, follows, the, um, you know, what I normally have access to. Or if I publish, you know, a PVA to a Facebook channel that I didn't accidentally point it to the wrong public website and have it pull, you know, the wrong answers. How do we control that mm -hmm. to make sure that these are still viable for enterprise scenarios? Yeah, good question. I'm going to repeat that very quickly. So the question is, 
what is the compliance story around how do we use, when we're building chatbots like Power Virtual Agents, how do we make sure they're secure? How do we make sure, especially when we're bringing generative AI experiences in, how do we make sure we've got that granularity of control and main, maintaining compliance? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll just answer from a platform perspective and then hand it over yeah. on the PBA specifics. So from a platform perspective, I think it's been reinforced, but I'll just say it again, uh, your data is your data, it doesn't leave, we don't train other, other we don't trade our models on your data to give it to somebody else so that uh, your competitors can benefit from that. So that is within your tenant stays, it is your data. From a platform perspective, there are governance capabilities to, to at an at a overall level to say, hey, I don't want to jump into the AI uh, push yet. Give me some time, let me evaluate it, and then I'll turn it on. So there are some settings available, and for each product right now, there are different places where you need to go set those settings to just say, you know, I don't, I don't turn off the AI capabilities, turn off the generative capabilities, because I don't, I'm not ready for it yet. Yeah, so that is available as well, just from a platform perspective. And then for each one of the layers, one of the things that Dwayne also talked about was we do have pre-processing, we do have post-processing after data comes back, to again ground it in both places wherever possible, ground it on real data. Uh, do the responsibility checks as well to just make sure we're not, you know, we're just being responsible with how we, what we expose to the users as well. So that's just consistent across the platform and we'll continue to make it easier, we continue to make it deeper to just make sure it doesn't go off the rails as much as possible. So that's from a platform perspective. For PBA? Yeah, and I can go ahead and speak to boost conversations or generative answers. So. There's a couple of ways that you have a lot of control for this feature. So you'll see today in the keynote, we spend a lot of time in this one page called the AI capabilities page. And right from that page, you have a lot of different controls for which data sources you're adding to that bot. So it's very clear and you know where that bot is going to be deployed, right? Um, you also have an ability to increase or decrease the filtering right? So that you have control of, of how much information gets returned, how strict the um, filtering is on what gets returned, right? Um, and so you have very granular control of, of how GPT answers will actually support, or generative answers, I'm sorry, that was an internal term, can actually work within your bot to make sure that you do feel like you're in control. Um, another way that we've done this is to implement an awesome testing experience within the test chat. So when you add a source and you go ahead and test it out, we give you the ability to provide feedback on, you know, was that a good uh, response? Was that not? We give you links to where in the data sources we were able to find this information so you can go validate it, right? So there's a lot of that human in the loop that's super, super important. Um, and then just like he said, there's absolutely the, the capability to turn it off if, if you're not ready, if you're not comfortable, right? Um, and we are doing more with, I think, did you mention the, the node? No, I did. Dwayne did. So we are doing more that you could have a specific node that points to a specific top or is used within a specific topic that points to a specific data source that you only want to be exposed to a specific channel, right? So we're trying to give you as much granularity and control as possible. Um, and the last thing that I'll say, and I can speak to this quite extensively if you if you want to learn more because I was a part of the process, but we go through extensive reviews with C our legal team within Microsoft as well as responsible AI. So Ashwini mentioned, you know, there are a lot of things that we do to make sure that we're being transparent, we're following Microsoft guidelines for the right way to ethically introduce AI into our products. And we are going through all of the, you know, checks to make sure we're being super transparent with you about the risk and the liability and, and how you can mitigate that for your organization. Um, and for every single feature that we're releasing with this generative AI capabilities and, and AI in general, we go through these processes. We look for, you know, any, um, potentially harmful use cases, and we go through a very rigorous process to make sure that, that we are checking all those, um, you know, checks and balances. Yeah. 
also just just to talk about like some of the governance components that you might want to look at. <clears throat> so be aware there's a we have a setting where you can say that you're not able to publish a bot if you have included the generative AI component. So there is actual setting within the within the administrative console that that will allow an, the admin to make a decision on do I turn this feature on or off. Now as a bot author, you can still play with it, you can still incorporate it, you just can't publish. Um, and that is there uh, to make sure that we can enforce that. And if you start thinking about lower and upper environments and you start thinking about how you handle your application lifecycle management, um, we can work with you to show you how to like make sure that, that you get enforcement as you go up so that you have maybe lower environments where you're okay with it but then when you were talking about specifically how do I make sure that, and this was a major concern um, before we even shipped, which was how do I make sure that I don't generate responses to data that I shouldn't, like an internal knowledge source. When you point at an internal knowledge source, the bot often, and this is why most people come to me and they say, hey, I turned this on and I pointed at my SharePoint website and it doesn't work. That's because you haven't authenticated. So you have to authenticate. The bot does not have a spin. It doesn't have a service principal name. So what happens is it's using the authentication of the user. Now, if you're inside of like Teams experience, you'll get single sign-on and such. But you have to make sure that you authenticate it because SharePoint's indexer is going to require an authentication and the user authentication. And it's going to use and impersonate the user that is authenticated to it. So therefore, if the user is getting access to internal knowledge, we are making sure that the bot is authenticated and that you have rights to it, even at the index level, before you actually take action. So one of the things is you start thinking about, oh, I'm going to build it with my own AI models. This is, again, an example of us taking a SaaS approach to keep you from doing something that you shouldn't do, because we already have numerous customers that have built things using uh, Azure AI tools. And what they have done is they've exposed their corporate data publicly with no authentication. And so this is very dangerous um, and you should not take that lightly. So this is one of the reasons why our SaaS platform is there to help you guys assemble and go in a safe manner. So sometimes the reason it, it doesn't work is because it's not safe and you shouldn't do it. So, And all of that goes through responsible AI communities and everything. We have to go through privacy and all of that, certifications to make sure that these things meet compliance levels. And so that is a big difference between when you just buy storage and compute versus buying a conversational stack, right? So I just want to make sure, because a lot of people get confused about that. Right? Excellent. <laughs> um, the second part is um, when it comes to the virtual agent and the power domain, is it possible to create a solution that will self heal, self generate a repair? If I have something that goes down and I get an alert, can it be put into motion to fix itself versus making a call out? So let me quickly repeat that. Uh, so you're currently using the Copilot and Power Virtual Agents, yeah. and you're, you're seeing good success, which is good uh, with your external URLs. But you're wondering, is there a connection between PVA and Power Automate to self-repair itself in certain scenarios? Amazing. Who wants to take that one? That is amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing, yeah. That's a great idea. You, yeah. You'll have it ready next week. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long week, yes. Uh, but, you know, it is fascinating to... Uh, I think you're, you're pointing to a direction that we all see the the deep reasoning capabilities in the large language models. And we are trying to bring it responsibly uh, into the product experiences. And what we just started from is just just the initial scratching the surface, right? Which is, hey, you can generate some, some answers based on some context. You can convert intent into uh, expressions of uh, whether it's a node in PVA, whether it's uh, automations in Power Automate. But really, this is a new platform. And just uh, this morning, the analogy that Panos used of the internet, uh, the, it, it is at that level of a new platform emergence. 
And everywhere you look, you can apply deep reasoning to whether it's execution history, what has happened, what is now different than what happened before, help me understand. Whether it's process mining, and I know Wasim is online as well, and just understanding how is work happening across my organization today uh, so that I can understand what's happening, and where are the opportunities for me to automate using automation or using chatbot as well. Uh, Self-healing gets into that as well, which is, okay, can I, for example, if I'm doing automation on my desktop, and I'm doing it using uh, an application that had, a, it, uh, that had a login button. And somebody changed that because they thought it was good to change it to sign in instead of login. And I'm still looking for the login button. And wh what the heck, it's not there anymore. Uh, just having that resiliency or understanding from a natural language perspective, what is the intention? What are you trying to do? Uh, and so that I can, I can be more accommodating uh, if, if you want me to be more accommodating. I think it's a fertile uh, field for us to apply this whole technology to bear. Uh, so I think we're just starting down that path right now, honestly. And uh, it is based on these feedbacks, and that's why we're here, to get the feedbacks for examples like, what do you want to do? Because we can go in a million different places, and our devs absolutely want to go in a million places, <laughs> but we want to focus the energies and say, you know, this is more important for us to go uh, look after. So thank you for the feedback, I think. Yeah. One thing, uh, if I may, one thing to add to that. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, perfect. Uh, one thing to add to that, uh, Ash, is already today uh, through the process mining capabilities, uh, if you plug the process mining tool to uh, the telemetry from PVA, which there is a template for uh, uh, on the Power Automate portal that we work with the PVA team uh, to achieve, and you plug that to your automation as well, you can see the end-to-end -end of what's happening, and you could define a rule uh, to find out that there is a, an anomaly, and then create automation for the self-healing. We we don't do it magically in the tool, but actually, you know, if, if you invest a little bit of time uh, into plugging the, the instrumentation to process mining, uh, you could you could do it yourself uh, today with the yeah. product. And I'm going to hand over to Gary here, but one of the things that, um, if you weren't aware, yet another thing that we shipped on, on Tuesday is the ability to integrate with application insights and be able to log custom telemetry events and even take and receive and send event or activities. And so I, I think Gary, kind of thinking about that aspect of it, I think you can kind of talk about what, like the scenarios that unlocks as well. It's like you read my mind. Um, yeah, so I, we we really have shipped a lot um, and it's it's really hard to sort of get this across in all of the announcements. But I think uh, two, two things uh, to your point. One of the things that we've now enabled in the new um, unified authoring canvas is the ability to uh, send events out to the client. So if you are um, if you've integrated a web chat on a website, you can actually have that uh, receive events from your bot, sort of silent events, not messages, and then effectively take action or make a change on the page or on the client itself. Uh, and that goes the other way as well. So you can actually have um, sort of an event handler on your uh, client, which will then send a silent event to the bot, and you can then take some action based on that. So I think bringing that together with some of the new AI capabilities that we are starting to see is definitely an area that we're interested in, almost um, uh, sort of build your own co-pilot, if you like. Um, and I think the other thing is, you've obviously had great success so far with generative answers. Um, and I would encourage you to um, definitely go to the keynote today um, and look at what we're doing in terms of not just answering questions, but also taking action on behalf of the user um, using uh, using AI. So I think um, we're not there yet. There are ways of achieving what you're looking for, but I actually think that the, the, the vision that we have in our mind for the product and the platform is not super far off. Very good. And just to quickly plug as well, so those sessions that we keep talking about and alluding to, so we've got Charles Lamana's The Future of App Development, which is the keynote, and then we've got the AI innovation with the Power Platform as a breakout as well, so to attend those two sessions. Yes, hey. I just had a follow-up, like, you know, you mentioned uh, generating the answers from, uh, from a known 
So, but how do you fine tune? How do you see if this is actually doing intent, you know, recognition? You know, uh, but as soon as that uh, user is coming in with a question, I mean, the C2 or you know, people are coming in. So, how does the bot then be able to recognize the intent? See, in the past, I would have passed it to the power automate and then have another. You know, uh, go call. It's very expensive, by the way. Three or four trips just to do one, you know, analysis. And so, in that sense, how it was happening there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I think I just repeat the question. If you, <laughs> do you want me to? No, so you're using uh, generative answers. How do you go more specific and fine tune and understand the? Is it doing the intent understanding? And how do you get the telemetry and the kind of the analytics on that as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I think. Um, the way I would respond to that is we are trying to put the right controls in place like we already have done today with our um, you can set the moderation level on the generative answers feature so that you can um, sort of determine um, sort of how um, creative you want those answers to be versus um, sort of more creative versus less creative. Um, so you already have some controls whilst we're in preview. We'll be adding further controls to control things like tone of voice, et cetera, as well. Um, and I would absolutely anticipate over time that we will give you, as Kendra mentioned before, more granular controls over which data source is being used, et cetera. Now, using the capabilities today, we have a great testing experience inside of PVA. You're able to immediately test this yourself. If you want to, you can build automated data sets to actually test against um, uh, the, the, every bot has an API associated with it, what we call the direct line API. So you could actually have some automated tests. We've seen some customers do that with, with great success. But ultimately, no matter how many controls we add, sometimes they won't necessarily meet your requirements, right? And I think that's where um, connecting with um, Power Automate and actually implementing something custom is absolutely okay. Our aim will be to meet the sort of 80%, 90% of customers' needs where we're seeing that demand. But the reality is with a SaaS product, you won't always hit 100. If we can, we will. But I think that it's it's a case of um, sometimes if it goes outside that boundary, our aim, and certainly the aim with the new unified authoring canvas, is to make sure that we are removing those barriers where previously you would have hit hard edges or things that were simply not possible. Our mantra now really is make it as flexible as possible so that if you can't do something with one of our out of the box features, which are very turnkey, that you can still do it by integrating with other parts of the platform or other parts of Microsoft. And we've only got a minute left, so go on, Kendra. Just, <laughs> just to add to that from kind of a user experience perspective, one thing that on the design side we've really been pushing for is a deeper investment in our out-of-the-box analytics, right? And I think with the addition of all of these generative AI features, it's so important that we give you the right telemetry, we give you the right views into how these, you know, answers are doing, how successful are they, how are they leading to escalations or less escalations, right? You know, how often are they accurate, um, et cetera. And so I'm going to put a plug for Dwayne's favorite feature request board. Yeah. Which share the AKA. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. It's a if you go to aka.ms slash PVA feature request, and I'm pretty sure non plural uh, that it will take you to our feature request website, and that gives you the ability to vote on a lot of things. So like uh, role-based access control at a topic level, which is a lot of governance things that people are asking for and things like that to go. Better analytics, put that in there, generative answers analytics, all of those controls definitely. Like this is, this is your opportunity, like Ashwini said, to guide us on what we build next and how we prioritize. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm just going to wrap up. So firstly, thank you for spending the last 45 minutes with us. It's, it's flown by. And to be honest, we could have stat, we could have stood here and spoke for about 10 hours on these topics. To be honest, there's uh, I think I've got about 500 plus messages that we haven't been able to answer, but lots of subject matter experts answering them in the chat as well. Um, so just as we follow up and uh, what can you take away from the session? We've put together some learning collections. If you scan the QR code, if you want to follow them up, I'll leave that up for a second. 
Um, of course, if you've got more specific questions, we're going to be at the expert uh, panels as well, so you can come and uh, ask us as well. Uh, it's just around the corner as well. So feel free to come, come and ask those specific questions. And again, you know, follow us at all the different sessions that we've got left. Charles Keynote at, I think, 12, 1, 130. check. 130, thank you very much. Uh, and then the breakout, AI innovation, the full stack development as well later today as well that focuses more on the development side of, of Power Automate, PVA, um, Power Pages, and Power Apps as well. So thank you very much for joining. The last plug I've been asked to share is we've done the Microsoft Power Platform Conference. Uh, we had it last year, and it's going to be even bigger this year at, at Vegas. So if you really want to become uh, an expert in these sorts of topics and you know, really focus and develop your skills, there's going to be uh, announcements. There's going to be lots of various different sessions for you to go. Start at 100 and whole day workshops, labs, and everything else. So we'd love to see you there. All of these faces and familiar faces will be there to, to come and uh, teach you and on all the awesome things that are happening. So thanks again for joining. Um, the AKAs are the brand new announcement blog. So everything that we've just announced yesterday and that we'll be showing at the keynote are available there. But yeah, we'll be here for a couple more minutes and then we'll make our way to the expert um, panel section that you can ask us any questions. So thank you very much. And thank you online.